I'd never really considered it before that there was this instrument that existed that could make kind of any sound you wanted. A sound that's beyond the rules of nature. I'm, I'm sure people wondered why on earth we were doing it. <laughs> the sound is the absolute, you know, critical thing really. And if you can't produce amazing tunes at the end of it, we, we should just give up and go. I think it all started when I was playing in a band in Spain. I bought a, a Yamaha QI-10. Messing about this thing one day, trying to program it, you know, these tiny little buttons, and thinking, well, let's make a keyboard or something. So that was how the original MM10 keyboard came about. And so it gave somebody like a, literally a sort of miniature little workstation. But artistically, it became clear that, right, we've got this, you know, two octave thing, let's make it make some noises rather than just send out some MIDI data at the back. The sound on synthesizers is obviously a, a massive do. It's that you're making a musical instrument at the end of the day, it's got to appeal to the musician. That was the moment then I, I sort of picked the phone up to Chris and said, look, you know, we're thinking about doing this thing, you know, would he be able to do the, the hardware? Which turned into the base station. So this is where I do all my work for the last 20 odd years. Ian asked me to make a contribution to this synth. Chris was already known as a synthesizer developer. In terms of the analog circuitry, his sort of in-depth, you know, design knowledge was far in excess and still is of mine. <laughs> Basically, this is my end of it, and and this part is Ian's Ian's end of it. I put in a filter and VCA, the analog synth part of the wasp into the base station. Now that is the uh, prototype of the wasp. The wasp, I think, is one of the most important synthesizers um, of the time. A lot of serious musicians felt that it was a little toy-like, even though the sound itself is incredibly sophisticated, I think. And you could never uh, not recognise it, it sticks out, uh, you know, even more so the Oscar. And here's the, the Oscar, with all its rubber. <laughs> You wouldn't get that off a, off a plug-in, that's for certain. Um, it's still, I'm still taming it. It's, it's, it's coming to me. There is that lineage between all three, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Wasp, the Oscar uh, and the base station. Bands like um, Daft Punk and Chemical Brothers, Orbital, they were bands that, that really inspired a genre of, of bedroom producers. Suddenly it was seen to be sexy, to be a, a knob twiddler, as it were. People wanted something new, but they, want, they wanted the, the, uh, the sound and characteristic of, of old synths, but they wanted it in MIDI and they wanted it with more modern capabilities. This, I think, hit the spot with a lot of musicians in the UK that wanted to emulate that sort of 303 acidy type sound. I had a, a base station rack, which was the base station without the keyboard, and I used that extensively on my first record with Sneaker Pimps. It was the go to bass machine. You could almost equate it to having a, you know, a hit single where lots of great um, ideas came together. This is a journey 
With the whole dance music scene becoming really big, it, it was a natural progression to, to follow this by looking at the world of drum machines. We thought, right, we can, we can do the same thing with the drum station. And that took probably a couple of years to design from scratch. So the big leap up was then thinking, right guys, let's, let's go polyphonic. We, we kicked off with the Supernova, which was known as the Supernova 1. It was the first multi-timbral synthesizer to have an individual effects processor per part. So we had to keep it digital. All of a sudden you can do all sorts of things that you could never really do with analogue circuitry. Um, certainly not without having enormous amounts of analogue circuitry. You can also do things that you simply can't do. And you, you can do things like effects. With it being armed with these set of features, you know, we knew we were going to have a sort of powerful beast on our hands. Very much focused then on the very strong dance um, music world. But then there was classic, classic people like, I believe Jean-Michel Jarre bought about half a dozen or something like that. And I remember bumping into Stevie Wonder when we were at NAMM once and, and he mentioned he was using it, the Supernova. That was, that was pretty cool, as he was always a bit of a hero of mine. <laughs> but it was, it was a fun and exciting time and by that time the company was, you know, a reasonable size. In, in the 90s, um, we used hardware uh, equipment to, to generate all sound. Uh, but, you know, plugins started to appear on the scene, and the first ones were pretty primitive. Um, but the benefits were huge. All of a sudden, synthesizers were available to run in your computer. A synthesizer for free albeit a fairly simple one, but that was the writing on the wall, really, for hardware. We made a nice keyboard called a K-Station, and we thought it'd be a nice idea to do a software version of that, so we did that, it's called the V-Station. And sales were, were phenomenal, we were selling about a thousand a week of these things. But within eight weeks, um, the software was cracked, it just killed it completely. So then we thought, ooh, not a great idea. We had a bit of a um, fresh look at things and thought, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. What's, what's, what's up and coming? And there were several great products coming on the market. One in particular was from a company um, called Propellerhead, who came out with a product called Reason. And it was back again to the ethos of the, right back to the beginning of the MM10, whereby this was a great product, but wouldn't it be good to have a controller that mapped to all the instruments in the rack? So um, that was how the Remote 25 was born. I started at uh, Novation around about eight years ago, and this was really the first project I had to take on. We'd made loads of great synths in our past, and now everyone was using computer software to make music. So that was really our goal, was to try and make them work as seamlessly as possible. I had three keyboards before, I've now been able to sort of trim it, you know, trim it down just using the impulse and one other keyboard and that's really, really amazing I think, you know, when the first time I used that impulse setup with the, um, using main stage and stuff, it was, it was like, you know, I'd never done anything like that before and it, it still feels quite amazing and sort of futuristic to me. There's so much control on this, you can do whatever you want. Um, after a while, you actually just want something really simple just to make music. So uh, we decided, well, let's, let's try and turn things on their head. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is actually the very first launch pad ever made. You can see here it says uh, P001, which is the code we give to anything we make from scratch. We drew this drawing of this box with some squares on and said, we think this is going to kind of take over from this. And kind of everyone looked at this a bit strange and said, um, uh, I don't get it. The launch pad was designed really kind of because we, we wanted it to be perfectly honest. Check, 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 check. 
Music makers were using Pro Tools and Logic foremost to make music. But to try and play them live was really tricky. Um, so of course, you know, Ableton came along and turned that upside down. But the only way to really operate live was through a Mac, or some crazy way of assigning it to your keyboard, which just really didn't make sense. Launchpad was designed absolutely to fix that problem and harness this new paradigm of making music in any way you wanted to. And also, uh, YouTube had just arrived. Performers were um, selling themselves on YouTube. Um, that, was, that was the way you found music now. And, and there are a lot of Launchpad videos. I mean, we did an estimate there's like 300 million views of Launchpad videos alone. Now, I'll never forget seeing the Madian video for the first time. And to now see that have 20 million hits and see Madian supporting Lady Gaga and having the launch pad at the centre of what he does. Yeah, I, I think everyone at Novation feels really, really proud of that. The launch pad and the remote SL are fun. They're a lot of fun, but they don't have their own sound. Their own sound really comes from the software. So what we need to do is still have the Novation sound and the Supernova 2 and the base station is the core of that sound. That's our heritage is in that sound. So uh, we really wanted to bring it back. It, it, was, a, it was a great moment, <laughs> I remember, when Novation um, came round and said, we're going to do synthesizers again. And work on the Ultra Nova was absolutely a great joy. Being connected to music is a very big thing for me. I, I, that, that spurs me on. And the fact that people are going to l use it and like it. It was when I got my um, uh, Ultra Nova, Novation Ultra Nova, and um, it was really exciting because we knew we wanted to have some amazing kind of bass sounds in the set and I think just I'd never really considered it before that there was this instrument that existed that could make kind of any sound you wanted which was kind of an amazing thing really having always played keyboards with just pre-programmed sounds in them. I'm using the Impulse uh, controller live now which I've taken a lot of sounds from the Ultranova that I created on there and put them onto the Impulse. It's really important to understand with us in the studio that it's a lot of experimenting and playing around, you know, and that's why it's great to use synthesizers because there are you know, endless possibilities for the sounds that you can create. It's often a case of kind of getting a sound and thinking, this sounds okay, but what if we just do this, this and this, and you know, pretty much sort of just mashing the knob sometimes and just seeing what you can come up with. Hang on, what was that? No, change it back. Yeah, that was, that was it. Thank you. Nova, um, vocal tune and so on, that was, that was good stuff to do. So, um, okay, this is the robot box. Work it hard and make it better. We had released the Ultra Nova, we had released the Mini Nova, and things were going really well. So clearly everyone wanted synths. We had to do an analog synth. We went back to Chris, Chris Huggett, the original designer. Like, do you think you can do this? Like, do you think we can really, really re-release a classic analog synth? And he said, yeah, of course, of course I can do it. This jumble of wires is a, a substantial part of the base station too. Novation asked me you know, what would be involved in producing an analog synthesizer. And in, in a few months we were, we, we were analog synthesizing. 
different square wave, sine wave, almost. I'm, I'm very pleased to see a, another one, another incarnation of the classic. Instantly feels that kind of the brute force kind of element. And I think in, in modern dance music, that's exactly what is needed. You need sounds that cut, uh, cut through and, and have their own presence. You tend to think, I, I couldn't possibly compete with the big company stuff, but, but maybe you can. And it's actually quite satisfying to have a, a piece of the market and actually have people say, I prefer this. Uh, I like what you've done here. Other countries were making making large quantities of synthesizers. Americans and the Japanese made great synths, but this country, uh, alas, made few. But the but the ones they made were really good uh, and and stood out because they were unique. I think that's what's really nice about it is it's 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 equipment that's created purely for you know musicians who know what they're talking about and know what they know what they want and are not interested so much in the kind of like you know the, um, the 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 brand and the name it's more about the actual gear which is so so incredibly fun and, and easy to use and, and has so many possibilities. Musicians are always trying to push the boundaries of what they do so as a new piece of technology arrives like the laptop or now mobile technology. They want to try and explore it in new ways to make music. So we have to always be there at that front edge, solving those problems for musicians as technologies change.